All right, welcome to Unit 3, Collecting Data for AP Statistics. This video will focus on Topic 3.4, Potential Problems with Sampling. All right, let's recall. The goal of selecting a sample for either a sample survey, observational study, or experiment is to get a group of people that accurately represent the population from which they were drawn. Even a perfectly random sample most likely will not match the population but it should supply the researcher with good data that will be very close to the population. If we don't represent the truth from the population, we introduce bias. So again, the goal is for our sample mean to be a good reflection of the population mean or our sample proportion to be a good reflection of the population proportion. If anything allows that representation to not be good, introduces bias. So bias occurs when certain responses are systematically favored over others. So an easy way to look at, um, you know, in, in simple terms, bias is when you don't get an accurate response that will best reflect the population. So anything that allows your sample mean to be very far away from your population mean, meaning way too high or way too low, or anything that allows your sample proportion to be really, really high or really, really low, from the true population proportion. And again, basically bias is something that gives you bad data, data that's not going to represent the population like you would like. Now there are two specific forms of bias. There is selection bias and survey bias. Selection bias is the bias here occurs in the way you select your sample, meaning that your sampling method did not involve an aspect of chance or random selection of the individuals or objects. Several ways that this can happen, but selection bias is any way where your selection method of your sample was not random or specifically does not represent the population like it should. Survey bias is when there's bias in the survey. This occurs after even a perfect random sample selected from the population. The bias here occurs in the way you go about collecting your data from that sample. And again, there are several different ways that can happen. So in survey bias, maybe how you selected your sample is all and fine, but how you collect the data for your survey is not fine. Now, there are several different types of selection bias. Again, ways where selecting your sample is wrong. We have voluntary response bias, convenience sample bias, under coverage bias, and simply not random. All right, so volunteer response bias is when you use volunteers to make up your entire sample. These types of samples will not represent the population. Asking people to be a part of a sample will usually attract people with strong opinions. Asking people to be a part of a sample will also detract people who either don't care or have something to hide and don't want to be asked. So if you're going to select your sample simply by saying, hey, I need some volunteers to answer these questions, or I need some volunteers to measure, you're really not gonna get data that's good. You're gonna get data that's usually strongly for or strongly against. Or again, think about the fact that when you use volunteers, the people that you might want to get to or might hide from you. Either way, the sample no longer accurately reflects the truth of the overall population. So how do you fix volunteer response bias? Don't use volunteers. It needs to be a random selection. All right, convenience sample bias is, you know, basically convenience sample is one that is selected quickly out of ease for the researcher. It is not random at all. These types of samples introduce potential for bias because they do not use chance to select the individuals. How do you fix this? Don't use samples that are selected out of convenience. So if I'm trying to get a sample of high school students and I'm like, I'm a high school teacher, I'm just gonna use my 40 students. That's not random at all. That was just convenient for me. Or if I need to take a sample of trees from a forest and I just grab the first 10 trees I come to, that is not random. That's just convenient for me. Those samples are not going to reflect the population. All right, under coverage bias, this is when part of the population has a reduced chance or no chance of being included in the sample. The sample will typically not be representative of the population. So under coverage bias is 
you think that your selection process is good, but something about your selection process completely undercovers a group of people. So some part of your population has no chance of being selected. Everything else in your mind seems okay, but if a group of people don't have any chance of being selected, you have under coverage bias. Here, you might even be doing something that's random, like it might involve randomness, but because a group of people never had a chance to be picked, they were undercovered. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. One kind of famous example is if you're going to use a telephone book to select a random sample of people. So maybe you randomly take five people from every page, or maybe you take five people from every alphabet or um, based on last name, or maybe you give everybody in the telephone book a number and you randomly pick 30 people to be in your sample. The problem is you are undercovering people who aren't in that telephone book. If you have a cell phone as your only form of you know, phone, the only way you can be contacted, then you're not going to be in a phone book. The only way you can be in a phone book is you have a landline. So anybody that doesn't get covered, you know, or anybody that doesn't have a, have a, a landline is not going to be even having a chance to be involved in this sample. So that is an example of under coverage bias. Um, or another example is if you select your sample at a football game. So maybe you're on campus for a college and you're trying to get a sample of students and you come up with this nice systematic way of sampling every 10th person that walks into the stadium for a football game. Well, that's not going to be random. It sounds random. It sounds like you're doing a good systematic sample, but you're undercovering all kids who made the choice to not go to the football game that day. They never had a chance to go to the game. They never had a chance to get picked because they weren't at the game. And that's going to completely undercoverage them. So that is a bias that could happen. Now, survey bias um, is a little bit different. Remember, survey bias is when something is wrong with your survey, not your selection method, your survey. There are two major types of survey bias, non-response bias and response bias. Now, it would seem at first glance that these would be opposites of each other. One is response, one is non-response. But in fact, they actually have nothing to do with each other. It's just the names that make it sound that way. Let's talk about non-response bias first. Here, individuals are chosen for a sample, but for whatever reason, they cannot be obtained to collect data from. So non-response bias is simply when people do not respond. So people are selected randomly, but they just don't respond. Now, why is this a problem? Well, maybe they differ from the people who do respond in a meaningful way that if I just allow them to not respond, well, then I never get a hold of them. So it is important that if somebody is selected to be in a sample, you get a response from them. So imagine a perfectly random sample selected, but some of the people in that sample choose not to respond. The problem is that they were selected, so we need their response. And again, this is kind of you know, a question that could pop up, where why is non-response an issue? And the issue is that maybe they're not responding for a reason. And the reason why some people did respond and the reason why some people did not respond, there's obviously like a gap there, like why? And maybe that has something to do with the questions you're asking. So if you allow them to not respond, then you're never going to get them. So, um, you know, if that difference is present in the sample, then it's also present in the population. Hence, we need their data, right? Like if people are not responding for any reason, well, then that's like something that matters and I need to get their responses. So don't let non-response become an issue. So how do you fix non-response bias? Well, find a way that ensures the response from everyone in the selected sample are collected. Um, maybe you call them, visit them at home. You offer an incentive. Um, I actually got a mail-in survey once. It was a survey that was mailed to me about what radio stations I listened to. And in the envelope was a $5 bill. And it said that if I fill out the survey and send it in, they will give me a $20 bill. And sure enough, they did. They knew that I got picked to be in that sample and they wanted my survey results. So they found a way to get me to do it. Now, as long as the incentive doesn't impact what I'm going to answer, you know, it's not going to make me list any other radio stations or anything like that, then that was their way of getting me to respond. Um, maybe just making it anonymous. Like, you know, if you're asking somebody, 
a question that's kind of embarrassing or something they might not want to talk about in front of other people. Okay, make it anonymous. So that way they do respond to you. Um, one way that you will see a lot of people think is the proper way to ask non to fix non-response bias is to just ask more people. Like typically you'll see like, oh, 100 people didn't respond. Well, just ask another 100 people. That is not the answer. The original people that did not respond need to respond. Call them, visit their home, give them incentive, do something to make them respond. All right, and lastly here, we have response bias. Now, response bias is any problem in the data collection process that will result in data that is untruthful or incorrect. So response bias is basically the response that somebody gives me in their survey is not truthful. It's a lie or it's wrong. Some possible forms of this are a broken measuring device. Imagine if I'm using a scale to weigh something and that scale is broken. Well, then all of my weights are going to be wrong. Obviously, that's something that I need to fix. But the responses were all wrong because of a broken scale. Um, confusing or leading questions. This is called wording bias, but it is a form of response bias. If I word a question like, hey, um, everyone hates the president. The president's doing a very poor job. What do you think of the president? See, I'm giving a leading question there where I'm trying to direct that person to give me a response that I want. And that's not fair. That's not good, right? Um, even a self-reported bias. People who are asked to give their own weight. So um, let's say that, you know, I'm doing a survey and I need everybody's heights and weights. Well, if I allow those people to just tell me their heights and weights, those, whether they do it on purpose or not, those answers could be untruthful or incorrect. So I need to make sure that I give them a scale to stand on. I use a measuring tape to measure their heights. That way I know the answers are correct. Um, another form of this is the person asking the questions could also influence the responder to lie. Think about when the dentist says, hey, do you floss your teeth? And you're like, oh, yeah, floss my teeth every day. Well, that was, well, at least for me, that's an untruthful response, right? But I said yes, that I floss every day because the who person who asked me, the dentist asked me, right? Another example of this is if I get a sample of kids, and maybe it's a great random sample, but I just say, raise your hand, hand if you do drugs. Well, come on, who's going to raise their hand in front of all their friends and in front of their teacher who just asked? So that's a form of response bias. Anything that could cause, potentially cause, your answer to be a lie or untruthful or incorrect for whatever reason is response bias. All right. Now, lastly, the thing I want to leave you with is this is usually something that will be potentially asked from you on the AP test is understand what direction that the bias may lead. So don't just know that there is bias going on. Know what direction that bias may lead. Now, remember, we're trying to find the truth. So is that bias going to give us an answer that's too high or is that bias going to give us an answer that's too low? I'll give you some examples. How often do you floss a week? Well, if the dentist asks this question, then the dentist is probably going to get a mean that is much higher than what's true. So if the dentist asks, he might go, ah, seven times a week, or even six or five, or maybe the truth is two. Well, the problem is that because the dentist is asking, you might embellish that number, and now my sample is going to be much higher than what is true for the population. Um, what do you think of the president? Now, if you use volunteers, you're typically going to get people that have very strong opinions, right? So the sample is going to be much more negative than it really is, okay? So let's just say that 60% of people are in favor of the president. But if you ask for volunteers to answer that question, then you're probably going to get a lot of people who are strongly against the president because they want to volunteer their answer. So your answer may be way more negative than it really should be. Um, have you ever smoked marijuana? If the teachers ask you this question, then the sample proportion is going to be way lower than what is true. Let's just say that the truth is that 40% of kids have tried marijuana, but if the teacher asks that question, you might only get like maybe 10% of your sample to say yes. Well, that's obviously a lie, and I got an answer that's way below the truth. So to figure out the possible direction of your bias, 
you just have to think, right? Like think about what the truth probably is, even if you don't know exactly what it is, and then think, is that bias going to make results higher or make results lower? So always take that into account when you're considering. So I have seen lots of AP questions that will give you a scenario and say, talk about some potential sources of bias and what direction that bias will lead the results of the survey. So um, just give you a couple of examples to run through here, but make sure you understand that, you know, is that number going to be too high? Or is that number going to be too low? So at the end of the day, a quick review of this video is that we have several different types of bias, but mainly we have selection bias and survey bias. Selection bias is something goes wrong with how you select your sample that creates bias versus survey bias is something is wrong with your survey that leads to untruthful or incorrect answers. All right, guys, hopefully this video made a lot of sense and I will see you in the next video.